And it had to be handed in on a particular date, which was only called the 30th, which some of you are very familiar with the fact that that's actually the date that Hitler committed suicide. And, uh, you know, for Purvis night. And I thought, well, that's intriguing. And I, I, I wasn't able to get the thing done before that. And I was already supposed to go to a friend's wedding in Essex on that day. So my girlfriend at the time said, look, I'll cycle round to the professor's house with your dissertation and get into it on that day. So I said, okay, fine. So I'm back in Essex at this wedding, and then I have to go to reception and I'm on my own at a bus stop for me on the stage for people that know Essex by a pub called The Elves, if you know it that well. And my attention is drawn to a car that's pulled in at the car park behind me. And three guys get out of this car dressed in full SS officers' uniforms. Now, you know, it's Essex, man, but this is a bit severe. <laughs> and at that point I thought, well, you know, this is April the 30th, this is the date that died, this is the date that I was just handed in. This dissertation of Nazi cultism has been handed in. And this has happened. What the fuck, you know, this is, is again an indication that something quite powerful has been, been switched on. So time goes by and this subject continues to inform me. In 1989 I'm part of Andy Collins Earthquest Group. And in September 1989, which was like the 50th anniversary of the start of the war, I gave a presentation to them on Nazi cultism as it was understood then. So it's, you know, Nigel Penick in the secret sciences. Satan and swastika, morning the magician, spirit destiny, that sort of stuff. About six weeks later, um, in those days, the Earthquest group, we used to go around Andy Collins' house on a Saturday night, and we had a few weeks on the trot where we would play, you know, this was like a party game, past lights. Let's sort of see if we can tune in to anybody else and see if we can pick up on people's passwords. Now bear in mind this is the Golden Age of Psychic Question and you've got some pretty serious freaking psychics present in the room. The stuff that came up, you know, ever much of a bit of a laugh and a joke it seemed to be, uh, turned out to be extremely powerful. I've mentioned some of it in my, my book Out of Goddess about things that were concerned about the Babylonian past life of mine. But what two different people came up with, they said, you were a Nazi past life, you were a Nazi cultist, and you weren't just any other person on the periphery, you were right there at the top of the flipping epilogue. And I thought, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of settled into my, settled into my psyche as something that, you know, in, in, at that time, your experience, I was experiencing so much wider stuff that this was just another thing. And it did kind of make me think, well, maybe this is why this stuff has such a resonance for A few years later, when I did second degree writing, you know, for people that think writing is just some, you know, new age stuff with that old crap, I can only say that my own experiences with it is blowing my fucking head to pieces. And when I did writing two, it manifested was an epic run through of, you know, when you say past lives, I'm not going to be dogmatic about it. I'm not going to say that, you know, this is really the case, that there even are such things as past lives, but there is something that switches on a part of your brain that gives you access to a state of consciousness that otherwise will not come to you. There is some emotional part of your psyche that clicks in. It serves some kind of weird and issue purpose. And this started happening big time then, and I started to get more sniffs of the Nazi stuff. And when I did Making Master in Glastonbury in January 1995, it went ballistic. And this was the same period of time, that, uh, 50 years after the liberation of Auschwitz. So there was like an amazing amount of stuff on the TV. And I fucking sat down and watched, I don't think anybody watched more documentaries on the Holocaust in January 1995 than I did. And I kind of, I was, you know, I've been willing to admit I was on the verge of some kind of complete, absolute crack up there because I was working in an office and I just imagined everybody in the office, you know, just like their head shaved in the pyjamas, just running down the road to the gas chamber. And I went out to South End High Street and I was just seeing absolutely, imagining everybody just all with their head shaved, all running down the road to the gas chamber. And it was like, it got pretty bad, it got pretty bad, but I did not resist it. 
This is why I think it's very important. I, I did not fear it. I did not try to suppress it. I did not try to stop it. I accepted it because I always thought that there was benevolent, compassionate intelligence, especially having just done all these rage initiations, that was trying to take me through some massive right process like this. So part of what was going on then was I was offered a, a kind of redundancy payment in the civil service. It was just enough money for me to potentially come and move to Glastonbury. And this is what I was trying to do. And this is in May 1995. And at that point, uh, again, it's, it's big anniversaries. It's the end of the war in Europe. There's going to be a huge thing, a huge event in Hyde Park. There's going to be two minutes silence all around the country and they're going to be like bacon fires which is very, very evocative, including one on Glastonbury tour all around the country. Now I turn on the TV that morning, loads of stuff going on outside Buckingham Palace, beer with him, yeah, okay. And then, Claire fucking Richard, man. See, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> to the point, mother, what kind of shit is that? You know, Cliff Richard is old, but he's not that old. He was in the wars doing here, seeing <laughs> this to the Queen Mother. I just turned the telly off in that disgust. And then so weird process is going through my head thinking, well, you know, the Germans could probably have beat us if they'd done this, they'd done that. And then I start, no, oh, stop, stop this shit now, please. Now at that point, I had a copy of Dear Fortune's Avalon of the Heart. Uh, it was the one that got a photograph of Glastonbury Tour taken by Janet Colin Bald on the cover. And it's just lying on the floor in the living room, on the other side of the room. Bit of an overcast die. This is no word of a lie, this is absolutely no bullshit. This is what happened. A ray of sunshine came through the window and hit out a lot of the hole on the cover. And in that instant, I just thought, yes, that is what I've got to do. I immediately knew that during the two minute silence that night before they lit the beacon fires, I would bring people up and I would try and recreate the unfortunate wartime visualisations in some way. We all imagine ourselves inside Glastonbury Tour, oh, for the night to the round table, the whole business. And this is before social media. I only managed to get, you know, less than 10 people to do it. I any colleagues did it. Very, very emotional. Yeah, I know that something absolutely massively important that happened to me in that moment. And when I checked in, there was a, a, an old girlfriend of mine from university died. She was a big fan of Mr. Babylon. You know, she very visual, very easily gets, gets into all these spaces. She experienced going into Glastonbury Tour, seeing Arthur Kent Dragon start bollock naked with a big stalking stiffling. And she goes up to him, grabs up the stiffling, and like this huge, like, False bolts of light in it just shooting across the flipping landscape. <laughs> Everything's going on. And it's like, whoa, the crop's gonna thrive this year and result. This is exactly what we want. You know, this stuff is not museum post. This is not Alpha Sun, Tennysonian, Stead, Victorian gentleman. This is the Penny Dragon Force. It's kicking, man, and it's right here and it's right now in this context. And I'm part of all this, and some alchemy is occurring that I'm involved in this process. And within literally a couple of weeks, I had secured my move to Glastonbury. And that was just absolutely fantastic. And there was another event involving the Red Cross where they had a beacon fire on Glastonbury tour, and this was in the start of August. And I made my way up there. And I was actually physically present now, and I looked back to what was going on earlier on when I'd been part of this thing of visualising all of that stuff again. And it seemed like it was getting more and more manifest, more and more strong, more and more real. So we get to the end of that summer, and I've started to get involved with a young woman, a lot of you know who she is, but I've talked to her recently and she doesn't want her name mentioned because this is a more a less nuanced age than when I first told this story in 1995 in a public lecture back in Glastonbury then. On the 29th of September, which is the date some of you all know as a, as a face of the old country, Michael. There was a guy who used to be around in Glastonbury called Father John, and he was like the head of a really strange, minuscule, little, obscure religious group in the Coptic Religious Church. I think it was a Coptic Celtic Church. 
And he's performed these really obscure liturgies to these bizarre sites, you know, uh, all the Glastonbury sites. And they used to let him go in Glastonbury Abbey and do stuff. And on the 29th of September, he's put, he's put out a poster that he's going to do something on Glastonbury tour. And I found a liturgy of uh, a celebration of the old country Bible that's not been used for the Reformation. So, you know, I think my girlfriend, yeah, okay, we're going to go for this. We're going to go for this. And I've arranged to meet her in, the, in the, the field at the foot of the tour. And the first thing I see, um, you know, coming along the pathway, above, the, above the, the level of the hedges, by the unfortunate old house, is this kind of crude gold crucifix on a pole. And it's like she's carrying it because it, this guy, Father John, the people that were supposed to turn up with it, have let him down. And he's got all this plumber. So she's, I end up carrying a whole bunch of icons and Bibles and you know, a whole load of clobber up the tour. She's carrying this big sort of crucifix on a pole. And we get up there and then these mates turn up. And this whole liturgy is done. Very, very archaic stuff. And he's all, yeah, you know, we're going to stamp, stamp on Satan and all this sort of stuff. And I'm kissing Bibles and I'm kissing icons and you know, I'm praying the bollocks off and it's like awesome and it's the face of the old country Michael and it's really sunny and we go down from, from the tour just thinking, yo, nice one. Later that night, we're in bed, you know, we're practically asleep and my girlfriend sort of says, I just had this vision and it's something that I started seeing months ago before I moved to Glastonbury, before I knew you really strong and it's suddenly come back to me. It's like this triangular castle. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's so terrible as that it's sort of, it's all ripped and blown up and there's like some horrible, enormous great serpent with a black egg in its mouth and there's all this screaming energy going around. And I said, well, yeah, okay. Um, see if you get anything more about that. And then she says, well, I think there's like a big crypt there. And I'm, I'm down in the crypt, and like, I'm naked, and I'm lying around on the floor, and there's all these guys in like robes standing around me, and like, I think you're one of them. And there's like these creatures that are like the fish dudes of Stingray. And it's like, I, I'm, like all the, I'm driving around, and there's all this flipping ectoplasm and stuff coming out of it. And I thought, I'll leave it out. You know, <laughs> This is not top of my wish this for how I want the face of the old Angel Michael to end. Now the thing about this whole vision is, is I don't believe in the historic historicity of it. You know, this is like something out of spirit of destiny, this is like your Dennis Wheatley, whatever. I'm not really sure what that meant, but what that keyed off was a whole really intensified, you know, whatever this past life thing is all about. Now what really struck me, and this was clear the next morning. This was absolutely clear to me the next morning. It was only after kissing icons, kissing Bibles, being on the tour for Archangel Michael, just giving this huge great yo to Archangel Michael and the Avalon of the Heart and everything here this time around, that it was safe for that shit to come out and start to be dealt with. And during that period of time, it was weird, there were a lot of people in Glastonbury that were all sort of saying, oh yeah, I think I was part of all that as well. There was um, a guy I know who had a real clear memory of being in the Voldevogel, uh, which is something that I don't write about in my new book, but I wrote about quite a bit in my crony book, that he'd been part of this very idealistic youth enterprise that had been kind of co-opted into the new Hitler youth, and he found himself out on the Eastern Front, standing on the edge of some giant mass grave, I'm thinking, you know, we, we're fucking at it now. This is, you know, this is, no, nah, this is not right at all. We had a really, really clear memory of that. And on the sort of more problematical side, you know, there was a guy who had got a past life thing of having in his old family, had been in the Holocaust, but he'd been a little child and he'd somehow been left behind. And he really played up, you know, I was in, uh, I met, I bumped into him in, um, the car part of what was then Safeways, which is now Morrison's, 
and he just starts <laughs> screaming at me, just starts giving me a real roasting about how you know how I was responsible for for all this stuff that had happened to him and what had happened to his family and the other cause. What can you say now? What can you do? What is there that you can possibly say that so that's where I'm sorry enough for you know that's where I'm at now. It's just bollocks there. You know. But this is the kind of level of emotion and power and strangeness that was erupting then. So this is all within the first couple of months that we moved into Glastonbury. And I'd already done a series of lectures and I decided that on Dean Fortune's birthday that year, which is 1995, December the 6th, I would tell this entire story um, in public for the first time. And it's like Glastonbury, there's so much cold gossip now, you know. So and so is in the Illuminati, so and so is the you know, an agent of dark forces and all the rest of it. I thought, well, all right, you want something to gossip about. Here's something to gossip about. I'm going to tell you all about my flipping past off the Nazi coast of the But I'm going to do it on Fortune's birthday. Uh, and that was actually tight. That was tight by the Isle of Avalon Foundation. That, you know, that circulated. And a certain amount of that stuff is still going around now. You know, there are people I've, I've talked to who have come into town. And I said, oh, I went to one of Paul Weston's there, she said, oh, yeah, he's really dodgy, he's dark, he used to be a <laughs> The next year, on a dear Fortune's birthday in 1996, I've been working in this factory, this dark satanic mill, and I've been thinking a lot about the imagery uh, in dear Fortune's workers, which is capitalistic, broadly, you have imagery, you know, up in Kefar, in Yesod, in Hesed, in Kabura. And I just started musing on it, and I started very easily getting complimentary imagery also for Moran Bynar, you know, uh, and Holden Nexar. And that became the basis for my Glastonbury Kabbalah, uh, which ended up getting published in Spring 1997 Avalon magazine. It's also in my first book, Mysterium Artorias. I led a whole visualisation with that on Dio Fulci's birthday in 1996 and it went down, you know, very interestingly. Uh, a lot of people got plenty from it and it, it gave the impression, even with the new imagery that I brought in, or so I thought, that it wasn't like you were trying to imagine something, you were seeing something that was already there. You were just somehow coming to it and the connections between it and where that took you off at was very, very powerful, very potent. Almost instant though. So, with all of that, you know, that's, that became a very strong part of my psyche and it came in, kind of went in cycles. But 2010, 2010 was the 70th anniversary, Battle of Red Dunkirk, Blitz, etc. So there's loads of stuff on the TV, all the usual gubbins goes around again. And, you know, I plugged into it, I started getting aware of it. Now there's a particular date, September 15th, which is considered to be um, the turning point in the Battle of Britain. You know, it was like after that point, you know, the Germans have lost too many planes, they changed their strategy, that's kind of commemorated as Battle of Britain Day. And I decided it might be an interesting idea on that day to set up uh, another public visualisation. Uh, and in those days, um, Trevor Lee's had the growth set on the go in Chilpore Street. So I did it in there. You know, we had uh, an event that was uh, advertised to the public and went through this visualisation again. And it was pretty damn vibrant. You know, people were really buzzing with it, people were getting some interesting imagery from it. And it was at that point that I thought, hello, maybe it's time to write a book about this. And it was then. Back in 2010, I started writing what has now become the magical Battle of Britain. Initially, um, having just done Alistair Crowley in the Inner Horus with a hell of a lot of Robert Angle Wilson with multiple reality tone considerations in it, I decided that it was going to be deal fortune in the year of Michael, the year of the old country Michael, and I was going to write it from that perspective. I got a cover done with that title. That was how it all started off. Uh, it may take a lot further now. Archangel Michael, Rudolf really Steiner's ideas about it, and so on. How that fits in is very much part of my book. That's how it started. And it ebbed and flowed. 
it ebbed and flowed and it ebbed and flowed in accordance with some quite turbulent stuff in my life whereby the whole of, of my everyday life and all the things that were nice and comfy about it were absolutely freaking incinerated. And then I would just kind of pick myself up and a year would go by and I'd write another book and then something happened and I'd come back to this one and then go for another in the next great scene. You know, we even had a situation uh, where um, a Holocaust denying Hitler worshipping ayahuasca hippies surfaced in Glastonbury and started posting on Facebook about what great guy Hitler was uh, and how if she met him she'd give him a great big hug. This is the kind of stuff that was confronting me when I was writing about, you know, it was death in 1945 and the spirit of destiny. Real, real strange craziness, but in the end, in the end, when I heard that this conference was happening now, you know, when I realised when the day was going to be, it was still so many months ahead, I thought, enough is enough. I'm coming to the end of my 50s, I'll be 16 in April, why in the decade, very, very, very satisfactorily, let's complete this thing, let's finally manifest it. And next year in September, there's a deal fortune conference in Glastonbury now, um, you know, I attended that at the end of last September and it was on that day that I sort of made my pledge, I'm going to do this thing, I am going to finally manifest this thing, whatever. And I'm not going to hold back on it, you know, uh, this, this is a powerful truth, it's not just for me, it's not just my witness, my jollies, it's symptomatic of a wider process that, you know, in the past when I've taken a bit of a risk and I've shared some very dark, strange material, other people have recognised that they're going through their own version of the same. And, and it's to serve that process and also to serve the fact that nothing is ever that simple. You know, I mean, okay, there are instances where we can say that something good, bad, but a lot of the time it gets very difficult. Uh, you know, if we believe in past lives, or we at least believe that there's a part of our brain that functions in such a way in our emotional consciousness as if to believe that they are real, then, you know, we haven't been nice and nice and paper all the way down through, have we? You know, we've probably misbehaved somewhere along the line, haven't we? We've probably had all kinds of weird shit that we've played out as we've been involved in the world historical drama that we sometimes can't escape from. So it's very strange at this moment in history when things are pretty damn strange in this country and in the wider world that are manifesting. It's here tonight, it's here this weekend. I'm hoping, you know, some of you already bought some, I'm hoping a lot of you will actually buy some of them. I commend it to you, yay everybody.